Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 25th, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the security program at the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope LSST with NCSA's Alex Withers. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is, recording, is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Just click on the chat, when, on the chat icon and the box will appear and type questions here. Um, and we also reserve time for the end of the presentation to ask questions as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Alex. Let's stop sharing here. Alex, are you still muted? Uh, no. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Give me a second. Okay. I can see it. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm Alex Withers. Um, I'm the information security officer for uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, aka LSST. Um, I'm a security engineer at uh, NCSA. Um, my work for LSST is, is part-time. Uh, aside from LSST, I work on other security projects uh, funded mainly by the NSF. Um, what I wanted to do during this webinar is sort of give an overview of LSST security program, both in terms of policy uh, and operations, and talk a little bit about what we do in terms of identity management. Um, so what I want to begin with um, is sort of an overview of what LSST is and what it does. Um, LSST is a, um, mainly funded by the NSF, um, but it, all, it is also funded by the Department of Energy. Um, and the idea is that they are building a camera and telescope on a mountaintop in Chile, um, where they will, for 10 years, starting in 2022, uh, take a, a sort of a, an image, a very high resolution, large image of the visible sky um, and basically this data is collected nightly, uh, and stored and computed over. Um, and really what LSST is delivering is not, you know, a camera and telescope. They're delivering data to the scientists along with, uh, the, the survey catalogs, um, that, uh, come along with the images. Um, and the idea is that, you know, when you're imaging the nighttime sky at that frequency, you're looking for things like transient events. Um, you are um, looking for um, uh, it, items uh, or, or bodies uh, in, the, in the nighttime sky that perhaps you didn't know about. So cataloging, you're mapping the Milky Way. Um, and a big part of the scientific uh, goal, I guess, is to probe the nature of dark matter and dark energy. So um, in terms of computing and networking, um, there's quite a bit. Um, you have uh, you know, a, a facility at the summit and the base of the mountain um, that's collecting this data and computing over it. Um, a lot of this is um, making sure, you know, that the data is collected correctly, the images are, 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 are correct, and also uh, this is where you would look for the transient events, you know, comparing images against each other and looking for uh, things that uh, suddenly appear and disappear. Um, and over long haul networks, this data is moved around the country, but one of the large archive centers or the archive center is here at the NCSA, uh, where it is stored and uh, further processed 
uh, and released. So um, the sort of three big sites when ELSIS T is operational, and these aren't the only sites, um, there are there the other data access centers, but the big ones are NCSA, the project office in Tucson, and as I mentioned before, the uh, summit and base sites. And there are two 100 gigabyte redundant fiber links from La Serena, Chile to NCSA. And those jump through Florida. <clears throat> so if you recall, um, I mentioned that LSIS T data is the deliverable. Um, the data it will eventually be released to the public, usually on a two-year time scale. Um, but before the data is released to the public, it's um, really only allowed to be um, uh, used by um, U.S. astronomers or Chilean astronomers um, and other individuals. And sort of a big part of our security plan is uh, our information classification policy that sort of outlines this and how data is to be classified and treated. Um, and, you know, we, 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 when we're moving the data around, it's going to other sites. And uh, I'll talk more about this, but they have their own security plans. But they still need to respect um, LSST's uh, information classification policy. And so this is where identity management plays a very important role. Um, and so from the user's perspective, there's really sort of three levels to the data. Um, and uh, basically, most users are concerned about level two. This is the data that uh, gets released, um, that the U.S. astronomers will sort of, um, uh, you know, search through and do their computations and findings on. Um, these astronomers may also derive data from this level two data. We call that level three. Um, and this derived data is restricted to subgroups within analysis T. So one group might derive data that they don't want other people in analysis T to necessarily have access to. So with a lot of data also comes a lot of software. Um, this slide is just sort of demonstrating the layered complexity of analysis T software. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, and it's a big part of our security plan is uh, dealing with this software uh, and making sure it's secure and making sure that if the software provides access to data and uh, uh, resources, that it's doing it uh, with proper authorization. So to start with um, the the security program, um, the basically it's fairly simple. There's um, a set of documents. Uh, headed by a master security plan. Uh, we have an incident response plan, the aforementioned information classification policy, acceptable use policy, and then LSST is divided into subsystems, um, uh, camera, telescope, data management, so on and so forth. Um, and each of these subsystems have their own sub plan that's specific to that subsystem. In addition, and those documents I mentioned before uh, are governed by LSST's Change Control Board. Uh, changing those documents uh, requires approval by a Change Control Board, um, so they're not easy, necessarily not easy to change. Um, but derived from these documents, um, which we can change at any time, are uh, things like our risk assessment tables, which are uh, broken up by subsystem. And this is done in a web-based application. Um, security requirements that come out of the security controls, those are put in a document. Um, and sort of, you know, uh, incident response playbook, um, which gives uh, users and staff uh, sort of one page simple, you know, sort of set of guidelines and procedures in case there's an incident. And that's just sort of boiled down from the uh, the main incident handling and response policy document. So to give you an example, um, almost all of our controls, um, we, we've been moving to NIST 800-171. Um, for now, that has been adequate. Um, it's uh, been very uh, useful and succinct and, you know, sort of guiding us in, in you know, laying out controls for each of the subsystems. 
And so a simple example of what you would find in um, the uh, one of the, probably all the sub system um, sub plans would be uh, this control on the slide, the you know limit system access to authorized users. Um, and so the requirements document, um, would say, well, you know, if you want to implement this control or you're required to implement this control, then let's say, you know, the system has to integrate with our identity and access management system, and it must make use of these utilities configured in the following manner. So the idea then is that these requirements, um, which are written out in a document, they can change without change control uh, board approval. Um, as long as they, you know, as long as they're properly implementing this control. And so really what we are driving towards is uh, relying on configuration management to make sure that um, in, the, in the end, the security controls are properly implemented. So I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, LSST um, is comprised of uh, multiple sites. Um, these partner institutions, um, things like Slack, Caltech, University of Washington, uh, they, they have their own um, security programs and they handle their own incidents. Um, the LSST security plan doesn't um, govern uh, what goes on at those sites. Um, we trust that as long as they're properly protecting LSST data, that it's adequate uh, to protect LSST resources. Um, so where does that leave our security plan? Um, there's, there's areas of LSST where legal and regulatory concerns come into play. Um, our security plan outlines roles and responsibilities um, and focuses on protecting LSST data. And of course, there's, there's areas of LSST that don't uh, have a security plan. Uh, an example of that is the site in Chile uh, and certain resources in Tucson. Um, so ch the Change Control Board, as I mentioned before, um, it, it really, when, when I say that it, it approves the security plan, what it's really doing is authorizing security related changes. Um, and the reason why that's, it's done that way is the project manager is the person that accepts the residual risk. So he's the uh, head of the change control board and the approval is sort of, the approval is acknowledging that whatever risk um, comes about uh, from the security plan or whatever documented risk, um, he is accepting that, um, that residual risk. Um, and we use a very simple table. Um, it's uh, a table that comes from a trusted CI's uh, a risk registry template uh, circa 2015. Uh, the table stayed the same, but we've moved this into a web-based application because it's important that we allow uh, LSST staff and users uh, to view this, um, especially uh, people like sysadmins um, who might be writing um, the puppet scripts, for example. Yeah, well, Alex, thanks for that uh, shout out. I'll uh, include a link to that uh, risk assessment table in the, in the video. Sure. If, yeah, thanks. So I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about identity management. This is a, a massive project within LSST. Um, and there are many needs that we have to cover with identity management. And one of the big needs is, is um, data access. The, the science platform by which uh, users will access and compute over LSST data. Um, and really there's, there's three ways users do that. They do it either through a Jupyter Hub notebook, uh, through a web portal, or possibly um, there's a API, uh, RESTful APIs that allow them uh, access to data. And so really the core goals of the identity management system is to identify these US and Chilean astronomy astronomers, excuse me, uh, make sure we can identify named individuals and delegates that have data rights. Um, so uh, it's important to point out that uh, LSST will allow uh, some individuals who aren't US astronomers or Chilean astronomers to have access to um, some or all the data or certain data releases. 
So these two uh, top two bullets, um, they, this is access to this level two data I mentioned earlier. We also need a system that allows LSST users to form collaborative groups and restrict access to data within those groups only. Um, this is the level three uh, data uh, I referred to earlier. And of course, um, you know, this just deals with LSST data, but the system also needs to manage a a a access to applications and services uh, and define uh, admin and staff roles. So um, going uh, sort of what we've been doing so far uh, in, in, in implementing this or, make, or, or achieving these goals um, is making use of in common and coffee uh, authentication, which gives us the edu person affiliation attribute. Um, sort of the core of our identity management system is uh, LDAP and Kerberos. Um, which will be replicated or is currently being replicated at NCSA, Chile, uh, and possibly Tucson. Uh, sitting on top of this, we have a uh, user group management uh, system, a software. It's an in house uh, NCSA software, allows users to establish an LSST identity um, and manage groups, uh, form new groups. I invite people into those groups. Um, throughout our system, uh, Duo uh, for two-factor uh, um, is, is an option. Um, what it is, the technology we're going with, um, it's implemented in some places. Um, the web app-based applications have been making use of CI logon. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about this later, um, but Psy tokens, um, LSST is a, uh, a potential user of Psy tokens. Um, we are definitely a use case for that. And Psy tokens provides uh, authorization uh, using uh, uh, common web-based uh, technologies like OAuth 2.0 and JSON web tokens. So just to give a sort of high view architectural layout of this, um, underneath um, all these, uh, all the technology, we have databases, APIs, file servers, web dab servers, even login shells that sort of uh, are clients uh, of all this. So it's very complex. There's a lot of different technologies that need to all integrate with this one single identity uh, uh, management system. Um, a big uh, goal also is allowing linking of external identities um, to, some, to one's LSST identity. Um, and we hope to do this, or this will be done during initial enrollment, and it's managed by the user. Uh, group memberships are based on the LSST identity, and forming groups and group memberships is a big part of uh, LSST's effort, or it's, it's really the core of authorization to uh, data and services. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the self-service and uh, group management uh, software we have. Um, so it's, it's custom built, as I mentioned before, um, and basically this system allows users to establish their own LSST identity. Uh, critically, it, it uh, presents them with an AUP, which they have to agree to, link with their outside identities. And once they have this profile, they can change their password, update their profile information, um, and possibly uh, begin to create and manage groups, um, uh, assuming they've been vetted, um, which I will talk uh, a little bit about later. <clears throat> and um, so just a couple screenshots of the system we have. Um, this is just me logged into my own LSST account. Um, and um, here's a screenshot of you know, me managing the LSST security group. Uh, it provides nice features like a group email. Uh, I can download member lists, so on and so forth. I can invite people into the group. Um, so um, going back to one of the large goals we had, uh, one of the core goals uh, for our identity management system is um, identifying uh, astronomers. Um, 
with potentially thousands of users um, obtaining LSST identities, um, we don't want to have a system where it requires manual vetting of the people, at least for the majority of people. We want to be able to say, you, you have an LSST ident identity, and we're absolutely certain that you are a US astronomer um, or a Chilean astronomer. And so we have had, uh, we've proposed to LSST's uh, um, governing a body um, that uh, we use the edgy person affiliation if it's available, although it doesn't tell us that the person is um, a part of you know an astronomy department. Um, but we've also explored the possibility of using things like the American Astronomical Society um, and maybe, you know, a union of these things and, you know, um, something uh, sort of um, combining these two things would say, you know, 90% of, of, of astronomers who sign up for this uh, will be covered by this. And otherwise, if we can't figure out if they are an astronomer in good standing, then that might require manual review and approval, which would cut down significantly on the amount of time it would take to onboard uh, people. Um, in addition to the U.S. astronomers, Chilean astronomers, um, we also have to uh, vet named individuals. And these people who have accounts uh, will be allowed a limited number of uh, uh, designated additional individuals. Most likely, this is going to be a professor who gets an LSST identity and then provides access to his or her postdocs, grad students, uh, et cetera. Um, they could potentially uh, invite others from the same institution as well. And of course, uh, an important part of all this is that there is a periodic uh, revalidation and review of these accounts. We don't, um, you know, especially with students, um, the, you know, they graduate, um, they maybe go to another institution, but they may not be on LSST anymore. And so we want to make sure that we are, um, constantly removing or disabling um, stale accounts, um, which is a big part of protecting uh, LSST data, as we really want to make sure only the people who are currently US astronomers, um, members of LSST, uh, have access uh, to the data. Um, and I just wanted to point out again, um, why we are working with side tokens. Um, batch processing analysis T uh, is uh, very important. Uh, it's the process that takes this data uh, and prepares it for release as level two data. And this is done currently with long lived Kerberos tickets. Um, we have a couple methods we use to manage these uh, Kerberos tickets uh, as the job lives on and does its thing. Um, but we're hoping to move towards side tokens uh, as a much easier way to manage um, this, this workflow uh, and ensure that the job has proper authorization to uh, access the data it needs to. So um, the last part of the presentation, I want to um, talk about what we're doing for security operations. Um, so we security operations is geographically far flung. Um, the infrastructure uh, is in Chile, um, but operations is here at NCSA. Um, and so any LSST resources at NCSA are, of course, protected by our security operations group. Um, and the same is true for the op observatory site in Chile. Um, and basically what we've done is we have uh, more or less a duplication of the security services at NCSA. Uh, and it's managed by our security operations group. Um, but it's a little bit more complex. Uh, LSST has offline computing requirements. So if it gets cut off from the WAN, um, there are some number of days that LSST is expected to continue operating um, without uh, interruption, um, assuming that you, you know, the network gets repaired uh, well within that time frame. Um, and at the uh, uh, observatory site, unlike LSST at NCSA, um, the network is uh, divided into enclaves. 
um, and these enclaves are sort of labeled by their observation criticality. So for example, there's an enclave where um, the integrated control systems sort of live to manage and operate the camera, telescope, and optical control system. Um, and uh, we have a very strict uh, inventory of assets uh, and the enclaves that they reside in uh, or straddle in some cases. And this is incredibly important um, to understand what is on the network and where it lives uh, so that we understand the proper security controls to apply uh, to those assets. So um, just going through uh, a sort of a high level view of what we do in terms of uh, security operations um, at the host level, uh, we rely on uh, host-based firewalls, mainly IP tables. Um, we don't have any, um, for the most part, it's Linux-based. Um, there are some React OS systems uh, and uh, a couple of Windows systems, but more it's more or less just Linux. Um, it's, we use Puppet for configuration management. Uh, in terms of endpoint security, um, it's OS sec. Um, we do have some antivirus for the windows machines. Um, and of course user accounts are centrally managed with the identity management system I talked about earlier. Uh, duo is going to be used for two factor on some systems. Um, for example, on system, well, on all systems that where a user, uh, uh, elevates to, uh, a privileged account, um, that will require two factor. Um, we centrally collect all system logs, and I think this is fairly sort of typical. Um, in terms of network level security, um, uh, the network is uh, software defined networking. Um, there are firewalls, but it's mainly uh, SDM whitelists. Um, and so this gives us uh, a lot, uh, both ingress and egress filtering. Uh, remote access is mainly just SSH and VPN. Um, and of course there is HTTPS access um, to the science platforms. Um, those will require two-factor authentication. Um, so the idea is that two-factor um, is required for getting into the perimeter of the site. Um, and access to, to the site is mainly by LSST staff. Um, because, you know, uh, sort of running this system, it's going to be staff, you know, all over the world, um, possibly. Um, they can't be there in Chile. So it's very important to have remote access, but it's also very important that um, we, we uh, control access uh, uh, with uh, uh, two-factor authentication. Um, at the perimeter, we have a bro intrusion detection. Uh, running off taps uh, and a tap uh, aggregator. Um, and management for our security infrastructure is done on uh, out-of-band networks uh, with a VPN. Um, and I will um, go into more detail in a couple slides. So in terms of uh, data level security, um, the risk assessment tables, um, we try to capture um, all the systems and storage that contain sensitive data. Um, and this is not just data that's, um, uh, you know, to be released uh, to LSS to users. It's also uh, data about the camera, the telescope, uh, and, and other sensitive data. Um, and we, the data is labeled uh, as per the information classification policy. Uh, sometimes this is very simple. It's maybe it's just the name of the volume that's provided by the uh, network file system. Um, and we uh, sort of stress that unintended release there of this kind of data is, is documented as a severe risk. Um, we are working on file system support for authentication authorization. Um, so this is possible. Um, in, in the three file systems LSST uses, which is NFS, GPFS, and um, uh, Samba. Um, but it's something that 
uh, has been very difficult um, to properly implement, especially within the context of uh, container computing, which Alice's team makes heavy use of. Um, and mounting remote file systems within containers has proven to be a challenge in terms of security. Um, it introduces, inadvertently introduces a lot of risk. And so we've been really struggling with how to uh, manage this risk and mitigate uh, against uh, the possibility of someone being able to mount any volume. Um, and so we are confident uh, we're heading towards a, a secure solution, um, but it, it has been a challenge for us. But aside from the rem uh, remote file systems, really the burden on data access falls on the LSST applications. Um, the applications uh, are expected to uh, check to see if a user is authorized to be able to access LSST data, uh, you know, whether by LDAP group membership or possibly some other method. Um, and so, um, you know, the developers um, have worked very closely with us to make sure that they're doing this properly, um, which is which is good. Um, physical level security is a concern at the observatory site. Um, mainly, uh, the the concern is is wireless devices and access points um, and things like uh, remote uh, portable storage, like USB keys. Um, especially within the SCADA enclave, um, people are, uh, you, you set up a lot of controls on your network and then people uh, possibly grow impatient with these controls and rely on things like USB keys to move around files. Um, and so this is something um, that we are trying to uh, understand and uh, uh, mitigate against. Um, and one of the things we've been doing or we've been planning is for visitors who bring their own devices to force them into a, a, a special visitor enclave or VLAN um, so that, you know, they're not plugging into a network jack or um, connecting to a wireless access point uh, unless the device has been approved or authorized. Um, so just to give, um, a detailed uh, picture of, of what NCSA Security Operations Group uh, is doing uh, in Chile. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the operations, uh, a security operations is managed from a completely separate network. We have a permanent VPN tunnel uh, from NCSA to Chile using uh, PFSense appliances. Um, and behind those PFSense boxes in Chile is uh, some VMware infrastructure uh, set up um, with high availability. This hosts our non-bro security services. So for example, things like uh, central log collection. Aside from that, we have two bro clusters, uh, one for production and one for development and testing. Um, and LSST is slated to have 200 gig networks, but right now it's just a, a 40 gig network. It's sharing uh, with other tenants at that facility. Um, and those networks are tapped and aggregated with an Arista uh, uh, tap aggregation system. Um, large data flows are shunted um, so that Bro doesn't have to eat them. Um, and otherwise it monitors all traffic in and out of the perimeter. Um, this just gives a diagram of, of how this is set up. Um, and the idea again is that anything um, security operational is totally separate and walled off uh, from the rest of the site. Um, and um, aside from, you know, there's, there's also redundancy in terms of access. We have a, an offsite bastion host um, that can get around or that can be used in lieu of going through this VPN tunnel. Um, and we have sysadmins in Chile uh, who work for LSST that also can provide, um, uh, if for some reason we can't access uh, machines through the lights out uh, uh, management network, um, they can always, you know, they they know enough to be able to um, 
you know, hook up to the system, the console, um, see if there's a problem or reboot it or, or something, uh, whatever might be needed uh, physically uh, in terms of physical access to, to these systems. Hey, so, Alex, uh, yes. Before we continue, we've got a question here. Sure. Uh, what's the security staff count like? How many full time employees does this all take? So, um, it's about two and a half. Um, and, okay, so it's, uh, I, I, let me break this down. It's, so there's, there's, there's 50% of me. Um, and there is, um, one and a half, uh, security engineers, um, which is split over two people. Um, and then there is, um, about, I believe about, uh, a full time person, um, uh, uh, spread out over multiple people for the identity management project. We expect, uh, when LSST is under operations, the proposal, uh, for operating, uh, LSST security infrastructure will be, um, two and a half people, um, plus, um, uh, the, an information security officer uh, at half time. So three full FTEs worth of time. And when are you guys uh, going to full operations again? Uh, 2022. Okay, continue please. Sure. So um, just to conclude, um, LSST, uh, we have a working security plan uh, covering existing and planned operations. Um, sort of uh, the, the future challenges I see, at least, um, is really making sure that LSST users and staff know what is expected of them in terms of security. Mainly, this is just, uh, you know, the, the, the information security or information classification policy. Um, uh, making sure the users understand that data is um, classified, uh, or it do, you know it does have a classification to it, and that uh, you know if you are moving data around or if you're sharing it with other people in LSST, that you understand that there's a risk associated with that, and there are proper ways to do it and improper ways. Um, and so we've focused. Uh, we have our own. Um, cybersecurity training uh, to raise awareness and make sure users understand that. Also, in, in our part in this is ensuring that uh, access to data is done in a, in a secure manner. Um, and of course, securing the core of LSST operations is critical. Um, LSST uh, is uh, a very um, mission critical uh, project um, running uh, weeks, months on end without interruption. And so I see security as being an enabler of that, ensuring that LSST is able to achieve its scientific mission. So I just wanted to shout out to Jim Basney um, at NCSA. He, uh, he has uh, uh, helped tremendously uh, to lead the identity management project for LSST. Um, and if there are any uh, questions, um, or if you want to just reach out to me, um, you can send me an email and I'd be happy to talk about anything and everything else is tea. Looks like we got a question here from Jim. Sure. Are LSST security plan documents publicly available or can they be shared privately with other NSF facilities for reference? They are not publicly available, but I have, and I am happy to share them. Uh, okay, if you send so, me an email, uh, that would be the best way. So okay. I'll include your contact info in the follow-up email that I send out. Please. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's just take a couple of minutes to let people type questions if they have them. And uh, let me grab the screen. Uh, one second. Uh, let's throw up some... Uh, some other slides here. Uh, 
Um, there we go. So uh, please, we'll take your questions now, but also we have a survey. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'll just throw up the survey link here for one second. Uh, uh, we take feedback, but also we appreciate uh, offers to present or suggestions for uh, potential presenters that would be good for our community. So please uh, fill out that survey and tell us what you think. And then um, just a little bit more about the webinar series. To view presentations, join the discuss mailing list or submit requests to present, you can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is July 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is RSARC, Trustworthy Computing Over Protected Data Sets. And our speaker is Miyank Varia. So uh, with that, um, I, I hear, I have another question here. What is the total staffing of LSST versus the identity and access management slash security and IT staffing? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Total, total staff versus the security team. Oh, it's total IT staff versus the security team. It says it? Uh, total staffing of LSST. Okay. Um, geez. Uh, I'm LSST is roughly uh, about 150 staff, staff wise. And so, you know, then um, it's difficult um, to put an accurate number on it because. Um, LSST is under construction, and so people come and go as as they need to in terms of you know uh, projects. Um, on on average, LSST is funding a, like I said about two and a half uh, security personnel. Um, that grows, uh, for example, with the identity management project, um, a developer uh, is coming on board has come on board to work half time for a few months. So that's, you know, bumped it up to three temporarily. But it's a very, very small percentage of the uh, average total number of staff. Okay. Um, could you discuss the types of security reporting that occurs? Um, so, um, the, so we, we, have the security plan states that we have to do assessments and audits. Um, and we have been doing that at least in terms of the, uh, the application uh, security. Um, we, we have, have people um, at the security operations group at NCSA uh, vet uh, and scan um, LSST uh, web applications. Um, and we do this basically through JIRA. Um, developers request this, um, and we go through a process and we report back to developers what's been, what we found, where we think there are problems, and what can be done to uh, possibly correct them. Um, aside from that, and aside from uh, vetting of any production uh, uh, machines uh, that go onto the network. We do not have a um, any other kind of auditing or assessment. Um, we do plan on having that um, as we move closer uh, to uh, 2022. Um, we have not, um, there's been no request from the NSF or the DOE for any kind of um, auditing or reporting. Um, there is a requirement from the NSF to report incidents, um, and we do we do do that. We've had a couple of incidents, um, and uh, although if you read closely, the large facilities manual states that that is only for um, projects that are un, uh, in operations and not necessarily for ones in, under construction. Um, so that's about the extent of it. I think the bi the big thing is just you know we report incidents, of course, the NSF. Um, but other than that, there really isn't 
any kind of uh, formal reporting. Okay, uh, we've got three more questions here so far. Uh, what are you doing to limit physical security risks? I think the, uh, yeah, that's, that's very difficult. Um, obviously, um, uh, physical presence is, is already limited. Um, uh, the, the, the facilities are locked down and they're very difficult to reach anyway. Um, um, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, Linux boxes, um, it's something that we are discussing and thinking about. We don't really have a good idea right now of what we can do about, um, limiting user access, um, uh, to these, to these devices, um, or ensuring that, uh, you know, you don't have someone who isn't supposed to be, uh, you know, in that room, um, or has yeah, physical access to the box doesn't get access. But, um, I think really the only thing we can do right now is just make sure that the users in, in the facility understand that and that they understand that when you do things like, uh, plug a USB key or portable hard drive into a system, you are potentially, um, uh, you know, uh, presenting, uh, uh, an avenue of attack. <laughs> Now, like I said, a lot of these are Linux systems and you can do things um, on the system to ensure that um, uh, this is not very easy or it's very difficult um, to, to make use of portable storage. But of course, if you do that, then you know, you're potentially um, making it very difficult for these people to do their jobs. Um, in terms of React OS, which is, um, uh, things uh, an OS they're using for their um, their the, the operations room you know for the heads up displays and whatnot um, I am unsure uh, what to do um, I don't know very much about it um, and it's sort of uh, uh, new new ground for me okay I uh, I missed an earlier question so I'm going to get to it now um, how do you identify the sensitivity of derived data do you need to understand objects, uh, for example, stars, galaxies, on the images being processed? Um, the only way we can do that is uh, the user has to be the one that uh, classifies the data. We, 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 we simply have no other way to do it. Um, we just, the user has to be, this goes, plays back into uh, training and awareness. The users have to understand that when they derive data, that they need to make sure uh, they label it properly um, because no one else is going to know if this data is, you know, falls into, uh, you know, the internal or sensitive kind of classification as per the uh, classification policy. Okay, next up, uh, regarding the in-house developed application for managing users' profiles, groups, mailing lists, et cetera, can you comment on the evaluation of third-party tools for managing some of those workflows, such as co-manage? Um, I really can't. This is, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not um, my, my wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, I have very little experience um, uh, using these utilities. Um, I come, my background, um, is is uh, been a has been heavily active directory based and so I'm just used to using that to manage users and groups um, uh, so the uh, LSST I will say is very happy with NCSA software um, um, they've not uh, uh, you know asked us to evaluate other options um, so it's it's at least as of yet even though it's just it's just really kind of come online. Um, there's been no complaints about it. Um, so, but I, having no experience with something like co-manage, I am unable to really, you know, uh, compare the two or make any kind of comment on that. Okay. Well, we've got two more in the queue. So uh, I, one, I heard Alex say that Chile and Tucson sites do not have a security plan. Why is that? Um, uh, that's a very complicated question. It's 
Um, it's not that they don't have a security plan um, necessarily. So, so Aura is the um, um, the the institution uh, or the body that's um, uh, uh, managing and um, um, running LSST. And um, it's just that um, their security policies and plans um, uh, are uh, just simply not adequate for what LSST is doing. Um, and I think it just points to the fact that LSST, uh, in terms of astronomy, uh, and and um, is very um, unique in that it's very ne heavily network and computationally based, um, and so we uh, Aura's uh, policies and plans just don't adequately cover that, and that is why we have to um, uh, come up with uh, plans from scratch uh, for those places. And uh, up next, uh, do you use DevOps tools in the operation of LSST? Do you think DevOps can help with the security? Well, we use Puppet, uh, which I guess falls under uh, the category of DevOps. Um, the developers of LSST, I mean, there's a whole DevOps team for LSST, and they make heavy use of the tools to deploy LSST applications um, and uh, services um, and to manage the uh, development of those those applications and services. Um, I think the developers are very security conscious, which is a good thing. Um, and I, I can't, I really can't comment in detail, um, but I do know they make use of their DevOps tools to ensure that their applications are adhering to LSST's um, security plan. Well, we still have a few minutes left before the end of the hour, so I just want to encourage people to ask a, another question or two if they have something in mind. But uh, while people are typing, I want to thank everybody for participating in submitting these questions and attending the webinar. And Alex, uh, thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you. So I'm just going to uh, just hold on a couple more minutes. Uh, again, if you are interested in following the webinar series, if you're new to our webinars, you can find out more at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next presentation is uh, July 3rd, 23rd, uh, which is our SARC, Trustworthy Computing Over Protected Data Sets. And uh, I will be sending out a registration link for that in a couple of weeks if you want to join that presentation. Um, but it looks like we might have uh, completed all the submitted questions. So uh, why don't we wrap things up? Uh, oh, wait, another one just came in. Here we go. Uh, NOAO uses Centrify to help enforce password policies on Macs. Have you considered using Centrify? Uh, no, although I do have experience with it. Um in a previous life. Um, um, no, it is certainly a possibility. Um, and um, I, we, right now, we, uh, passwords are, are sort of ma are managed centrally, right? They, they manage with um, Kerberos and the, um, the custom management application I talked about earlier. Um, and that is proven adequate so far um, although, like I said, it's very nascent. Um, it's uh, just, you know, this, this whole um, identity management system being deployed for LSST is, is just, just now, um, you know, uh, online and just starting to get used, um, uh, at least, you know, beyond just developers. Looks like, uh, could you... Could, could apply to enforce group policy across other platforms. I think he's saying it could apply to enforce group policy across other platforms. Oh, yes. Um, I guess my biggest, my biggest concern is um, React OS, um, which is a Windows NT clone. 
and um, you know, if you go with a product like Centrify, um, uh, it, it, does that vendor provide support for that operating system? Um, and my my worry is that you find something you know nice like Centrify. Um, maybe the project's even willing to pay for it, uh, and but then you find out well, uh, it's not supported on all the platforms you need it to be supported on. But it's certainly worth looking into. Okay, well, I think we have uh, addressed all the questions that are open. And uh, I will be sending out a, a, an email with this video and links to slides and Alex's contact information. So I encourage those of you who enjoyed this presentation to share it with your colleagues uh, and, and contact Alex if you have any uh, follow-up questions. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording.